Sir Kannan Gopalakrishnan. He was working as a senior architect at Engineering Design Research Center L&T Construction, India's largest construction company. He's also worked on projects ranging from institutional buildings to international airports, apartment complexes to aircraft hangars. He's also attended three international conferences and two national conferences and has also presented technical papers at the Jawaharlal Nehru University Delhi and the MSRIT Bangalore he's also won the national championship at Archimen at the India's largest architecture quiz sir kannan gopalakrishnan currently runs a design firm habitat design studio and he is also a visiting faculty at the renowned architecture schools in tamil nadu welcome to ugc lecture series this is ar6502 history of architecture and culture 5 we are dealing with unit 1 where we are leading to a new architecture this is lecture number 5 in the series and if you remember lecture 4 we saw the types of neoclassicism we saw uh, the structural neoclassicism of shinkel and labruzze on the previous episode and in this episode we will move on to romantic neoclassicism and we will be looking at the works of ludo uh, and the famous work of ludo the royal salt works at artisanus let us take a look at how romantic neoclassicism came into existence from the eastern europe we'll have a quick background look at start and then let's proceed with the works of ludo so romantic neoclassicists were self consciously concerned with the production of high art and disdain the mass art like most of the art movements neoclassicism started as a literary movement and these people the neoclassicists uh, disdained the mass art of uh, the didactic writing uh, the writing which aims at propaganda so that kind of work is what neoclassicists were disdaining they didn't like that kind of work so their opponents in in contrast to them they uh, organized themselves around and they were actually supported by the communist parties uh, in their existence and uh, they viewed literature differently so they according to them literature is a primarily an utilitarian uh, segment of art it's not seen as an art movement as such it is a utilitarian segment of art so they saw this as a means of strengthening their point of view they saw this as a means of strengthening the soviet rule over ukraine and other parts so this was a setting in eastern europe like i mentioned earlier so we are looking looking at ukrainian culture right now the works of neoclassicists were anti romantic and anti folkloric those days they sought universal themes based on what ukrainians culture to be uh, an organic part of the entire culture of the western european hemisphere culture so they didn't look at folklores they didn't look at what ukraine was about they didn't get into deeper meaning of their own culture they didn't do all that instead they saw ukrainian culture to be a part of the entire european culture according to the romantic neoclassicists we should assimilate the highest culture of our times not only in its latest manifestation but also in its original forms so from this commitment the demand for neoclassicists to become a writer started to increase so from a neoclassicist what was required of them was to have a comprehensive complete knowledge of ukrainian literature works and also to have a comprehensive knowledge and work of the entire world literature at that particular point of time which was relevant to them and uh, the craftsmanship needs to be poetic of the highest level high art in their view could be conveyed only through clarity of thought and mastery of form so the thought process must be clear only then according to them they will get high art so with that in mind we will look at what their main purpose is about their poetry is characterized by balance the plasticity of image and the logical ordering of subjects and composition so the subjects needs to be particularly in some logical order and their composition must have certain logic 
behind it the composition the way they are arranged and everything there must be certain ordering principles which should predominantly rule their poetry the main purpose of literature according to them according to the neoclassicists was aesthetic they rejected the counterparts who were looking at the the traditionalist agitation moralizing of the literature thereby increasing the utilitarian value of literature they didn't want to do that according to them it was literature was an aesthetic it it needs to be logical it needs to have a certain plasticity it needs to have a certain composition a certain ruling ordering principles and thing and it must create a sense of beauty within us not a mass propagandist view which was followed by the men of the day so these were some of the neo classicists of the day and you can also see a neo classicist building on the uh, right hand side corner wherein you can see doric columns uh, supported by a pediment on top so <coughs> romantic neo classicists what they did was in order to gain a knowledge of world literature they translated into selected works of ukrainian literature the best of world literature so they converted them into ukrainian language so from antiquity to the parnassians in france they changed they converted all the literary works in the world to ukrainian so that they can gain exorbitant amount of knowledge of world literature and be conversant with what is happening around the world so that is what happened at that point of time and uh, let's take a look at uh, one of the famous architects exponents of neoclassical architecture claude nikola leda claude nikola leda was uh, the earliest one of the earliest exponents of neoclassical architecture he lived in uh, mostly in 18th century somewhere between 1736 and 1806 he used his knowledge of architectural theory to design not only in domestic architecture but town planning as a consequence of his visionary plan for the ideal city of shaw he became known as an utopian so this person uh, he has tremendous architectural theory knowledge so with that what he did was he not only did architecture uh, buildings domestic architecture and other type of buildings he also started visualizing an ideal city back in 18th century thinking of how an ideal city must work and how do you, how an ideal city must look like was getting tremendous importance because the modern things were happening at that point of time wherein the machineries were starting to evolve and cities began to develop the industrialization was happening the industrial revolution started uh, at that point of time and uh, people started colonizing other uh, countries people started trading with other third world countries which were Uh, at that particular point of time a little less civilized than the european counterparts so at that point of time making an ideal city plan was of the highest order so he didn't make a regular plan for the shock he made a visionary plan he made a very conceptual level plan so he became known he became known for his utopian ideas and if you're wondering how claude nicolas leda looked and these are some of the sculptures and paintings that they painted of him you can see him along with children his career was pretty much curtailed by the french revolution in 1804 so what he did was he collected all his works together and he started drawing everything and converting them to a book and he published all his works titled uh, l'architecture considéré sur le rapport de l'art the murs et de la legislation His most ambitious work was then completed Royal Salt Works at Arcasanas a utopian town showing many examples of architecture parlante it also demonstrated his socialist vision of architecture he was uh, educated by a private architectural school in paris the school was established by none other than jacques blondel whom we saw in our previous episodes that he was one of the earliest proponents of neoclassical architecture who schooled a lot of people and uh, his school emphasized native baroque tradition but they also exposed the students to the english architecture which was happening at that point of time so after completing his studies leda assumed several government positions as an engineer 
uh, mainly he worked on a lot of bridges. Ladar's uh, dramatic style owes much to the fact that he never visited Rome. It was very important for architects at that point of time to go visit Rome, uh, Greece, Athens and other places where uh, the classical architecture were uh, exorbitantly celebrated. So all the European architects at the point of time had uh, one great mission in their lifetime just to travel to Rome and visit the buildings of Rome because uh, in Rome was where classical architecture was at its peak and after that they had Romanesque architecture, they had Gothic architecture, they had Renaissance architecture, they had Italian uh, Baroque architecture and there was a lot of things that happened in Rome and uh, architects at that point of time usually went to Rome so that they can study all those architecture and try and replicate in their own cities. But Leda never visited Rome, not even once. But he went to England though, where he was influenced by the Palladian tradition of architecture, which he was already familiar with because he was studying with Blondel about the Palladian tradition of how to build and all that because he was already exposed to English literature. Although much of Ladau's architecture is very, very practical and functional, the visionary aspects of his works are actually better known. Uh, he was actually a very practical architect, but his conceptual work is really well known. So these, uh, have a look at the conceptual visionary aspects of his work on the screen. On the left hand side, you see the city of Shaw, wherein he works on a circular plan for the city. And he has the main buildings lined up here. He has plans for different kinds of buildings in different locations. So this is his idea of a uh, visionary village. His designs quickly became symbols of ancient regime and their exaggerated use of classical elements seems to anticipate postmodern classicism. This is very important because uh, in after modernism came another particular period of style called the postmodern architecture where the classical elements are exaggerated, the use of classical elements are exaggerated and uh, they are sometimes made fun of and sometimes they are used as joke on architecture itself. But his designs, uh, it was, became symbols of ancient regime because he exaggerated the use of classical elements. Back in 18th century, he almost invented the postmodern classicism. Uh, Ladau rejected complexity and, and uh, artifice because um, he took inspiration from antiquity which in which he designed simple perfect volumes because he thought they were precise and balanced geometry that is what architecture is all about. These are some of the visionary works of Nicolas Lada because look at the way in which he articulates form, cylinders, spheres, pyramids, cubes, rectangles, cylinders. Look at the way in which he articulates perfectly geometric forms in his architecture. So this is the kind of architecture which Lada had in mind. Let's take a look at the most famous work of Lada. It's called the Royal Salt Works at Arkesina. The Saline Royale or the Royal Salt Works is a historical building at Arkesina in the department of Dubes, which is in eastern France. This work is a very important example of Enlightenment era in France because architect based his design on philosophies, on a lot of philosophies actually, that favored arranging of buildings according to a certain uh, base ge geometry, a rationale, and, and there was always a hierarchy between the parts of the original project. So the scheme was actually built uh, for the King Louis the Sixteenth. And let's take a look at how the story goes. Before that, this is how the building was designed as. This was the original design, but um, unfortunately, only this particular part of the original design was actually built. And all these parts were not built at that point of time because the French Revolution took over and there was a lot of fund problem which happened in that particular point of time where this thing did not happen at, during his time. But it was built later in his memory so that um, we can see now as to how this would have looked and it's all grandeur. His 
idea came from the fact that he expanded the semicircular form of this complex into the representational core of his ideal city of Shaw. I was explaining the ideal city of Shaw and its planning in the previous slides where let me go back to that slide where we talk about the ideal planning of the city of Shaw. This is Shaw and what he has done here was he has just taken this particular portion the semicircular core of Shaw and he has tried to put it in this place. So here you can clearly see the semicircular Shaw and uh, this is how the building would look like. The picture on the left that you see here is here from the internal courtyard of the main administrative building. The salt evaporation sheds on the axis were high roofed like all the agricultural buildings at that particular age. Uh, while the director's house in the center was a low roofed pediment with classical porticos. This is the salt evaporation area. It has a very, very high roof because the smoke has to go on top. Without even having received any request from the king, what Ladu did was he started designing the salt works. So the project was something of an abstraction that he had no site in mind. Without any site in mind, without that uh, geographical constraint in his mind, Lodha started designing a salt work factory. So his first design uh, was presented to the king in uh, 1774 to, the, to Louis XV. It was unconstrained by any practical consideration. The project was highly ambitious where uh, Lodha imposed rigid geometry on the overall design and the design looked somewhat like this. He placed around the edges of an immense square the building and here in this plan no building stood in isolation. All the buildings were connected to each other by means of spaces and corridors and colonnades and rooms. Covered arcades linked the midpoints of adjacent sites so that from here if I want to walk to this place I don't have to walk all the way through here so I can simply take a shortcut through here. It was very very practical. So these arcades were forming another square within a larger square and uh, the central walkways alone took 144 Doric columns that supported the complete arcade. What he thought was the factory would keep all their firewood in the central courtyard here and uh, he had quarters for the guards, he had a chapel, he had a bakery and he had all the requirements of what uh, factory needed at that particular point of time. He had at each corner of the square and at the midpoints a two-story square buildings that would house various parts of the operation. These are those various operation squares. Different process of the building happens in a systematic way here and these are the rooms for people who used to work. So this grand idea was taken to the king and uh, the king rejected the project. He particularly objected because there was extensive use of columns, features that he felt were more appropriate rather for palaces, churches and other buildings of that sort and not for a factory. At that particular point of time people had very very limited resources to put on a factory whereas uh, people had a lot of money and people had a lot of ideas to invest on in palaces. So he thought this particular architecture was more appropriate for palaces and churches not for uh, factory, not for a factory. So what he did was he worked on a second project which looked like this. So this is the original plan for salt factory. Here is the main administrative building. Here are places where the factories are located, tax collectors buildings on sites, workers quarters and houses for other people the grand central open space and a lot of open space on the sides also. This is the main entry and in the main central courtyard he had two poles for lights and in the night time these lights will be lit, the entire courtyard would be illuminated. Such was his grand plan. <coughs> the semicircular complex will according to his opinion reflect a hierarchical organization of work. He said it's an ideal city forming a perfect circle like that of the sun. 
so he had a semicircle which was radiating from the center uh, the entrance of the building sits at the midpoint of the semicircle contains one guard rooms on on the other side a prison and a forge guard rooms on one side prison on the other side he had quarters for laborers carpenters on the one side and marshals and coopers on the other side uh, they were expressing his social ideas even the laborers of the salt factory would get something as similar to all the other people because uh, his idea was expressed in a very very clever format so let's take a deeper look at the plan this is the entrance building like i said this is how you enter the building and uh, when you enter you can have you can see some of the staff quarters on either sides some places to store elements and some staff quarters these two buildings on either sides right in front of you are salt extracting buildings by means of evaporation four is the general main administrative blocks and the director's house five is it has the stables for the director the horse horses and other animals will be tied over here so this semicircle is was the first thing that he designed he thought uh things according to romantic neoclassicism things needs to be particularly in some geometric order so semicircle was very very appropriate for that particular geometric order where he thought the entrance must be right in the middle and on both sides of the entrances he had laborers quarters and on one far end he had the prison and on another side he had the guards room so then what he ha- added was in the diameter of the semicircle he had added the production facilities the salt extraction facilities and he added the administrative block in the middle so the regular neoclassicist building what happens was used to be something like this where all the buildings will be connected to each other thereby from one part of the building you can go to the other part of the building without having to cross any open space you can actually walk through the entirety of the building this is how usually neoclassical buildings are designed even if you see the in, the original plan which he composed for uh, the salt works the same thing was followed from one part of the building you can actually walk to any part of the building with covered walkways you don't have to walk between buildings whereas in this he has shunned that particular idea by he has actually separated all the buildings separately the stables were separate the director's thing was separate yeah, the entire thing what whatever happened here was stretched and everything was as if there was a simple bomb that was placed in the middle and everything got blasted and moved to the sides the resulting building was a little bigger but he made this for two very basic reasons reason number 1 was when one building catches fire the fire will not spread to the entire factory the fire will be contained in that particular place the damage by fire was one of the most common ways in which the building could be destroyed at that particular point of time because all the lamps everything that you see were all uh, fire lit lamps we didn't they didn't have electric light bulbs back then so they all resorted to uh, fire that gave them the light so which means there was a large uh, there was a lot of reasons why fire could easily spread and destroy a building so he separated the buildings for main reason which is fire and for second reason if there is an epidemic if there is a disease for one particular point, people it will easily get spread to the other building so this means that the disease cannot spread if the people can be quarantined in that particular location and the disease will not spread so such a visionary plan uh, a simple uh, design strategy that allowed to solve two major problems of that particular era was such a genius of the royal salt works project so like i told you earlier there were plans of having two lanterns right in the middle of the courtyard which will illuminate during the night but due to economic constraints these were never built unfortunately these were also not built but that was another story altogether so he designed the buildings in this fashion he had the director's houses the production units the guard house prisons the laborers units the units for coopers and marshals the entrance main gate 
and uh, he added a compound wall like this initially he thought all the firewood to be placed in the middle if you remember the previous plan which i showed you in the square he thought he will place all the firewood right in the middle so that it can be used by any part of the building but in this building he has designed a very beautiful courtyard right in the middle and he didn't want to place firewood in the middle of the building so instead what he designed was he designed open spaces on the periphery and he wanted to place all the firewood in this areas behind the production facilities and in the middle was a beautifully landscaped courtyard with light that was his intention i mean and he also had the larger space between the compound wall and the laborers quarters where each and every laborers house could have a garden of their own they could grow their vegetables they could grow fruit bearing trees and they could have a nice landscape court where children could play in the evening they don't have to be disturbed by the noise and smoke that is made by the factory over there so clearly their re relaxation areas are separated by the buildings and another courtyard here so but all this particular place will have all the requirements that a factory needs all the uh, raw material the firewood and everything else would be in this particular area so that was a very clever idea and the central entrance portion was recessed so that to give a grand entrance to the whole compound this is another look at how the royal sartrux would have been the top picture gives you a look of one of the factories and look at how he has broken the monotony of the main salt works by introducing a nice arched pediment here right in the middle so that he can easily distract the entire geometry by providing this particular thing according to lada everything needs to follow strict geometry so the columns in the main arena main portico had cylinders and squares circles and squares stacked on top of each other look at the nice shadow which the square is casting on the circle looks so beautiful so the director's house has a belvedere on top which belvedere is nothing but a place where you can um, have nice views to the outside world because you climb up a stairs and you have a nice vantage point you can see uh, the landscape and the surroundings that's a belvedere it could be a form of a tower or it could be a form of a watch house it could just be a simple chatri or it could be just a terrace also it could be any form so a director's house has a belvedere on top and uh, the main thing about the royal sartworks is his ordering principles at the spine at the central diameter of the building he has designed all the industrial elements and at the axis where you have the central axis wherein you connect the two different porticos the entrance portico and the director's portico so you have a diameter of all functional elements on one side and then you have the another line connecting another visual line connecting the entrance portico to the director's portico so the two porticos two colonnades coincide with each other giving a very very grand look so let's quickly look at what we understood from this lecture we saw the elements of romantic neoclassicism with a beautiful example understood the basics of romantic neoclassicism we understood the works of leda and uh, the architecture of loyal salt works at arkesana with this you should be able to answer the following questions which are going to appear on the screen right now what is romantic neoclassicism how did it come into existence explain the philosophy and building style of leda with an example why was the royal salt works one of the most important neoclassical buildings explain this with sketches i look forward to meeting you with more interesting buildings and more interesting architects on this segment so thank you so much